All right, we talked about how World War I began after Britain declared war on Germany after Germany invaded Poland. Now I want to go back for a minute and talk about a concept called Blitzkrieg. That's B-L-I-T-Z-K-R-I-E-G, Blitzkrieg. Now what Blitzkrieg was, was lightning war. That was a German name for lightning war. That's the German word for that. Um, and it's just a very, very quick, very well orchestrated war. Um, and the concept is that you move more quickly than your, your adversary can keep up with. So just like if you're playing a sport, if you're much faster at, if you're shooting basketball, you're much faster at running, uh, much faster at getting your shots off than your opponent, you're going to win. Well, with Blitzkrieg, if you're much faster at attacking than your enemy can defend, then you're going to win. Uh, in the the invasion of Poland, German Germany's blitzkrieg was so well orchestrated that within two days, a hundred thousand Polish soldiers had died. So it was such intense fighting um, that there were a hundred thousand casualties uh, within two days of the invasion of Poland. And you're going to see as we look at other countries that are invaded by Germany, uh, as Germany continues its blitzkrieg, its lightning war, uh, other countries just fall very quickly, almost like dominoes, um, because the wars are so well planned, the battles are, are very well orchestrated, um, that they just keep moving quickly, 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 and no one else has time to defend. Um, so countries like Denmark, Norway, even France, um, fall very quickly. So after the invasion of Poland, let's move forward to 1940, um, spring of 1940, so April. Um, in April of 1940, Hitler uh, began Blitzkrieg in other countries, and he started with Denmark, and Denmark literally fell to Hitler within hours of the start of the invasion. Norway also fell very quickly. So Denmark and Norway, um, Norway lasted for a little over two months, which they did a lot better than Denmark, but that's still a very short period of time. So but the problem with Norway was, though, they had um, Quisling was the gentleman's name. Uh, I don't want to call him a gentleman, I guess was the man's name. Um, he sold uh, his own people out to the Germans. So he was secretly working with the Germans while he was in a high-ranking position politically in Norway. And he actually helped the Germans take over Norway in exchange um, for a good political position when Germany took over. So Quisling is kind of like Norway's Benedict Arnold, only he was successful. So the people of Norway, if you say Quisling's name still, they do not like it. They're, it's, it's even worse than a Benedict Arnold. It's a successful Benedict Arnold. So if you mention Quisling, they know who he is and they don't like him. Um, but Norway wouldn't have fallen quite as quickly, but still, they fell within about two months. So after these successes, Hitler decides to move to the countries on his west. And he attacks Luxembourg, Holland, and Belgium, and France. Um, Luxembourg lasts two days. So the Blitzkrieg absorbs Luxembourg in two days. Holland, five days. They fall very quickly. Um, Belgium lasted 18 days, so they lasted a lot longer than um, Luxembourg or Holland. And France is going to last about six weeks. So here's what happens with France. So in June of 1940, the German Air Force is strategically bombing um, fortifications on the French line. So they're flying over and the fortifications that France thought were not going to be able to be destroyed were very quickly bombed by the Germans and that meant that they weren't available for use by the French. So there was less resistance um, and the continual bombing of France just weakened the French military very quickly. Um, a lot of their artillery was destroyed, some of their aircraft was destroyed, soldiers were killed, and Britain comes over to, to help France. And the French keep getting pushed back and back and back along with the British. And it gets so bad 
that the German forces surround the British and French forces in France at a place called Dunkirk. Now this is a very famous uh, port in France because of what's going to happen once the French and the British are surrounded. But initially, it looks like the war is pretty much over before it even began, at least for France, um, and most likely for Britain, because their, their soldiers, a sizable portion of them, are cut off. They're up against the sea, so they have nowhere to go. The, the German ground forces have cut them off from the rest of France, and their back is against the sea. And the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, all they have to do now is fly over, drop lots of bombs on Dunkirk, and then let their ground forces come in and finish sweeping up what's left of the French and British military there. However, a very fortuitous event happens. Um, once the French and British are cut off in Dunkirk, they have nowhere else to go but over, this, over the English Channel to Britain, and there aren't any boats there, or at least there are very few boats there to carry them across, a very heavy fog rolls over. Um, and so the town is covered by a dense fog. And this means that the German Air Force can't bomb because they can't see anything. I mean, surely they could, they could fly over and drop bombs, but they can't see where the people are, they can't see where the houses, the hospitals, whatever they're wanting to hit, they can't see where it's at. And Hitler had ordered the ground forces to stay back. He wanted the glory to go to the Luftwaffe. And so the Luftwaffe can't do anything because it's foggy. And the ground forces have been told, you don't go in there, let the Luftwaffe take care of it. But communications get cut off with the German soldiers, and they don't realize that since the Luftwaffe can't fly over, that they're actually supposed to advance, and there's no way to contact them at this point because the communications have been cut off. So the army is just, the, the German army is just sitting there. And they sit there for several days just letting the British and the French, French stay in the town. And what happens is people from Britain realize that there's trouble going on, that the British and the French soldiers are cornered in Dunkirk. So British citizens that have anything that floats, I mean, yachts, fishing boats, anything they can find that floats, a bunch of British citizens come over to Dunkirk across the English Channel and start picking up British soldiers and taking them back to Britain. Um, and this, the several days they had, allowed them to transport um, well over a quarter of a million soldiers. So about 330,000 British soldiers and some French soldiers um, are taken back across the English Channel into France. However, once the fog lifts and the Germans realize, ah, we had an opportunity, we let it go, and now the British are back over in Britain, um, the French have nothing left. Their army is just destroyed and the British soldiers that they had in France to help them are gone. So France very quickly has to sign uh, an armistice, really a surrender agreement. Now this is irony at its best or worst depending upon your viewpoint. For the Germans it's sweet irony. Um, for the French it's very bitter but the French have to sign the surrender papers in the very same railroad car that the Treaty of Versailles was signed um, in 1918 with the Germans. So the Germans actually orchestrated, they make them sign this. On June 22nd, 1940, France signs their official surrender papers in the very same railroad car that the Germans had signed their surrender papers in. Now, for the British, this is very difficult because now they're it. They are the only country right now that's really actively fighting the Germans. America, we're going to see our role as far as supplying weapons, whether or not we're going to do that, whether we're going to stay isolated, but right now Britain's it for a little bit of time. Um, and Winston Churchill, we're talking 1940 now, Winston Churchill has been elected as Prime Minister of Britain, and he's much firmer than Neville Chamberlain. He doesn't like the idea of appeasement. Um, he says basically that we need to stand up and fight. This is an, an excerpt from a speech that he gave. Um, and he says, as he's accepting being prime minister, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. You ask what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might 
and with all the strength God can give us. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer it in one word. It is victory. So this is the outlook of Winston Churchill, which is victory at all costs. Whatever we have to do, we have to stop this. But it's going to be very difficult because Germany is going to try to bomb Britain into submission. Their idea is to throw everything they have at Britain with the Luftwaffe. So they're going to fly over Britain and just drop bombs. It's actually called the Battle of Britain. And it's a, a very fierce aerial battle where the German aircraft are just flying over and carpet bombing cities. Um, now they initially started bombing during daylight hours. However, Britain didn't take this lying down, so they shot down tons of German aircraft. Uh, the losses were three to one. Three German aircraft for every British aircraft that was shot down. Um, and they also would shoot anti-aircraft artillery up at the German aircraft as well. So Britain took to bombing at night, and they would drop thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds of bombs onto cities uh, like London, Plymouth, Manchester, Birmingham, Dover, Portsmouth, and all these cities would just, every night pretty much, all these cities would get bombs dropped on them by the Germans. And the Germans thought that the British people would eventually say, enough is enough, we surrender to the Germans, and let's just stop the war. However, it just made the British people matter. They just decided we're going to, no matter what happens, no matter how many tens of thousands of citizens die, and tens of thousands of citizens did die in the Battle of Britain where Germany just kept flying over and dropping bombs, they decided whatever happens, we're going to fight this to the end, and we're going to stand up against Germany, and we're going to win. So the Battle of Britain actually had the exact opposite psychological effect that Germany thought it would have. Okay, now let's talk about probably the biggest mistake Hitler had ever made in World War II. Uh, this is Operation Barbarossa. That's B-A-R-B-A-R-O-S-A, -A -A, Barbarossa. Before Hitler enacts Operation Barbarossa, we need to understand that Germany and Russia had signed a non-aggression pact, which basically meant Germany was saying, I won't attack you, Russia, if you don't attack me. So Hitler had made this agreement with Stalin. Now, Hitler got greedy for land, and he decided that he wanted to attack Russia. So he goes on the attack, and he launches a very, very large surprise attack on Russia. And Russia was just, I mean, they were really, they were leaving Germany alone. They were sticking by the agreement. And then on June 22nd, 1941, Germany just plows on into Russia and starts their offensive. And the code name for this offensive was Barbarossa or Operation Barbarossa. And they were going to st uh, strategically attack Leningrad, Stalingrad, and Moscow, which are three very big cities in Russia, very key important cities in Russia, particularly Moscow. But the Russians don't respond like Germany thought. They, they thought, Germany thought, Russia is going to be caught off guard, we're going to go in here, do Blitzkrieg, and Russia is going to fall very quickly. Now Russia had a hard time responding at first, but Russia is going to be one of the fiercest fighters in World War II. You're going to see in the next section of the chapter, they're essentially going to carry on the whole European campaign at first for a couple of years. They're going to, Germany's going to be attacking, attacking, attacking Russia, and Russia's going to be it. While Britain and the United States are off in Africa or in Italy, Russia is pretty much taking the full brunt of Germany's aggression. And a question that historians often ask is, what would have happened if Hitler wouldn't have attacked Russia? I mean, if you think about it, with the massive casualties that Russia sustains, with as much as they invest into the war effort, it would have been very difficult for just America and Britain to pull off winning World War II without Russia. So possibly, and quite likely, had Hitler not attacked Russia, the outcome of World War II might have been very different.